Jesuse Kurubeidanu. And now lift your hands, please. And now shout your hallelujah. Good morning. That video was shot on August 22nd, 2012, about eight years ago, believe it or not. Seems like just last year, 2012 does. But 2012, at a crusade in Nigeria, and as you can see, there is a sea of people in attendance, uh, very hungry and eager to know and experience Jesus. Uh, speaking there, I, I, may, maybe some of you know, it, you, you, it would be great for you to know this man. Uh, Evangelist Reinhard Bonnke uh, is the one speaking. Evangelist uh, Bonnke is is actually with Jesus. He's, on, he's gone on to be with Jesus. We'll get to see him really, really soon, I believe. Uh, but uh, most of Evangelist Reinhard Bonnke's uh, crusades would welcome well over 150,000 people. Uh, here's a couple of photos of the various crusades all throughout the continent of Africa. And these aren't 50 years ago. These aren't 30 years ago. These, these are today. This, this is what's happening in our time. The night before this video was shot, Evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, uh, as he would always do in his crusades, preached the gospel uh, to literally tens of thousands of uh, men and women and then give the call to receive Christ and make him Lord and Savior. And, and every crusade, tens of thousands of people uh, would give their life to the Lord, would, would get saved as we uh, have coined the phrase. Um, the second night, which is actually the night that you, you are seeing, that you saw, the second night after, after you're born of the Spirit, Evangelist Reinhard Bonnke would preach on what it means to be baptized in the Spirit. And uh, he would speak on the baptism, bring understanding to this wonderful gift called the promise of the Father, where we are endued or clothed with power. So the Spirit is in us. Now the Spirit wants to clothe us, be upon us, and equip us for supernatural works of ministry. And what you're seeing there is uh, Reinhardt praying for the crowd and then immediately the Holy Spirit falling, the Holy Spirit coming and baptizing, who knows? Who knows? Thousands upon thousands. And you heard what I heard. You heard them speaking, uh, even though Nigerians, you, you, you can tell, uh, if, if you've been around very long, you can tell that they are speaking with other tongues, all right? And uh, as, as evidence of receiving that baptism. Does that not build your faith? Does that not charge you? That, 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 seeing that video, I just want to encourage you, when you get on YouTube today, instead of looking at how to shoot deer, good, although there's nothing wrong with that, okay? How to fix cars, Brad, you need to start your own YouTube channel. Uh, again, nothing wrong with that, okay? Ladies, I don't know what y'all look at. I know what I tend to look at, but... Go on over there to some Reinhardt Monkey videos and just see what God has done. The dead have been raised at these crusades. 
a young girl years ago, you can look this video up, had been dead three days. Dad, mom, bring her to the crusade. God raises her from the dead. Powerful, powerful. I want to declare something this morning. Right now, all around the world, God is pouring out His Spirit. And the church of Jesus is in the midst of a worldwide revival. I'm going to say it one more time, and there's a reason. Right now, all around the world, in the midst of chaos, confusion, and pandemics, God is at work, and He is pouring out His Spirit, and the church of Jesus is in the midst of worldwide revival. Now, the reason why I chose to repeat it twice is because I didn't want to say that. I didn't, I didn't say that, uh, really, I didn't say that and proclaim that because I wanted to. I said that because God told me to. And, you know, it's just really wise to do what God says, whether you feel like it or not, right? Right, that's what obedience is called. I'm glad when I feel like obeying, okay? Obedience comes a little bit easier. Now, let me explain. Making that statement takes a, a lot for me to say. Not that I don't long for that to be true, and really not, not because I don't feel that it is true for certain parts of the world and certain parts of the church. And until this week, as I was praying over our church and this message and, and many of you by name that I know are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I struggled to proclaim that truth with great confidence and and really with very little excitement because, and I hate to admit it, I've had to repent of this, but I've been seeing the church as a whole through the filter and the lens of the American church. And depending on where you are looking, the church in America looks very powerless and void of the Holy Spirit's leadership and void of the Holy Spirit's manifest pr presence and manifest power. Much of what the church in America has been doing has been done without the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Much of what the church has been doing has been built on the wisdom of man, the words of man, the charisma of man, the, the passion, the pursuit of man, um, the giftings of man. But God is shaking things in America. Does anybody sense that? He is shaking things in America. And He doesn't shake to destroy. He shakes to test and prove. Anytime God prunes, it's for the purpose of greater things. I just want to really encourage you as we were singing the last song, Canvas and Clay, this morning. You, you really got to lay hold of the songs we sing. Not because we're singing them, but because they will really build your faith. And they will really lift you out of muck, mire, and valleys if you come in here feeling low. You've got to understand that God isn't going to work out things for your good. God is working things out for your good. I don't necessarily know how to explain it yet because Revelation sometimes, God doesn't give us words to explain it. He just gives us the grace to understand it. That's what Revelation is. God's promises aren't sitting in a warehouse on a shelf somewhere. Okay? Since the beginning of time, they, they, they have been on the loose, if you will. They have been aimed. The trajectory of God's promises are aimed at you. They, they are coming at you. They are on their way. And in due time, I don't know when the time is, but there is an appointed time when the fulfillment or the manifestation of that promise will come to be. There is nothing that can stop God's promises except for 
your refusal to receive them. There is no demon in hell that can stop God's promises from becoming your reality. There is no government, there is no pandemic, there is nothing in this world that can hinder the fulfillment, the arrival of God's promises in your life. They are yes and amen. And you need to lay hold of them. Build your life. The wise man and woman builds their life on what? The rock, which is what? The word of God. And when he says the word of God, he's not necessarily pointing to words on a page. He's talking about eternal words spoken. The word of God. Amen? The question is this, or let me just make this statement, finish my thought. This week I was praying and the Lord corrected me. And he just said this. Brad, I'm not failing and I will not fail to fulfill my promise to build my church. She will be pure and clothed in power. I am at work even in America. God instructed me to say this. He told me to stop saying revival is coming and start declaring revival is here. So we're changing the language at Restoration House. You know that we are ensnared by our words. Life and death is in the power of our tongue. And we can prohibit things and we can kill things and we can give life to things all simply by what we confess because it's with the mouth that we confess what the heart truly believes. And so we are going to confess that revival is here. And it may be odd to say it because we tend to, we tend to view what God is doing through these things right here. And these things are pretty deceptive at times. So we're going to see what God is doing through spiritual lenses. And revival is here. And it will increase with measure. Okay? What it will be is not what it is. But what it is is not what it will be. Okay? It is increasing. It is growing. As, as darkness increases in the world, you have to understand that there's a, an eternal work going on over here. Grace will begin to abound. And the fulfillment of God's promises. God will fulfill His promise. And the question here today is this. Will you be, or better yet, are you a part of, are you a recipient of, will you be a host of what God is doing in this hour? And this is not a question for someone next to you to answer. This is a question for you to answer, to reason with, wrestle with. What does revival look like in me? What does revival look like in my home? And what does revival look like in my church? What does it look like in my workplace? What does it look like in my city? And how can I become a conduit, a host, an activator? How can I become a force that awakens, that brings, that allows the revival of God? Will you be an observer or will you be a participant? It's either or. Will you be wanting it or walking in it? I'm convinced that there's some people that, that, that are still wanting something that they could already be walking in. The true church, Jesus' church, is not dead, and she never has been. I struggle with the word revival because the word revive means to awaken. But if I know Jesus, he does all things well. What does that mean? That means he doesn't have to circle back and try to redo anything. So the church of Jesus, the real church, is not dead and she never has been. The true church, Jesus' church, is not in compromise and she has never been. The true church, Jesus' church, isn't losing members. No parts of Jesus' body ever dies. Never dies. Because why? He is alive. Resurrection power is within him. He is, he is the resurrection power. And, and, and no parts of Jesus' body ever dies. Jesus' church is, in fact, growing in strength and power. So what you are seeing in the world, don't call it the death of the church. Call it the pruning of the body. Okay? Anybody ever lost about 10 pounds? You didn't go looking for them, did you? You didn't, you didn't mourn the loss of those 10 pounds. You celebrated, right? Because it's what? Unneeded. It's unnecessary. 
It, it, it easily besets you. It keeps you from running five miles an hour. Is that a lot? Yeah, I guess it is. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't do five miles an hour, so it's a lot to me, okay? But the Lord is, the Lord is in a weight loss program right now in America. And the body of Christ is losing weight. She's getting strengthened. She's getting stronger. She's getting solid, right? The true church, Jesus' church, is not in question about the great promise of the Father called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus called the baptism of the Spirit the promise of the Father. There is no debate in the true church as to whether or not the baptism of power is for today or not. And I am not pointing to any church. I'm just saying that within churches, there is the church. God has His church spread out everywhere. Do you understand that? He has members of His body. Okay, I think we all can understand and agree that just because it is a church doesn't mean it is the church. Okay, and that is not to demean or, 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 or disqualify anyone. It's a whosoever will gospel. God's not kicking anyone out. He is not raising a wall to keep anyone out. No, it's a doorway. Whosoever will come on in. Okay, I want us to pray this morning. And I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to bow your heads. I want to lead you in a prayer. I really want you to, 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 to sincerely speak and say what we're, what we're leading you to say this morning. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord, give me an ear to hear. Only what you are speaking. Your words are life-giving and transforming. Here we go. Lord, do something in me for me that leaves me declaring only God could do this. Only God could speak this. Pour out your spirit upon me. Fill me to overflowing. I want to be your witness in this hour. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Valentine's Day. We love you. We really do. We really do. You are loved. You are valued. You are precious. You are not Tupperware. You're fine china, right? Although I like Tupperware, okay? Got nothing against Tupperware, okay? But you are valuable to us, and uh, we love you. We really, really love you. And uh, just thank you for being here today. I, I understand there's some who do not want to, you know, may feel a little anxious or nervous about getting out or, or possibly walking through the parking lot or something. I totally get that. that, that I, I get that. Uh, nothing wrong with that. And uh, thank God for technology that they're still, I hope that they're watching. Uh, I, I want to encourage you that if you're not here, you need to, you need to watch. Uh, hopefully you've gotten the promotion or the text this week about our updated YouTube channel. We have our messages on there updated now. You don't have to watch the entire service. It's just the message. And so really want to encourage you. Soon we'll have the ability to go back like we once had podcasts. So you can listen while you're you know, working out, trying to lose weight and... Uh, going through, through, through you know, town with the, with the car and everything. So uh, really want to encourage you to do that. Stay, st stay with us, okay? Stay with us. Uh, uh, you know, what God is speaking to us in these series are not series, they are seasons. And so we are in a season right now, and I want you to go with us. I want to say this, that humans were not meant to, to depend on human strength. When God created us, He created us to be power assisted. Anybody ever driven a vehicle without power steering? That is not fun. It's not fun at all. You, I mean, it's work. You've got to constantly work at it. But man, you get into a vehicle with power steering. Wow. I mean, you, you, can, you can do it with your, you know, your, your pointer finger. You can do it with your pinky if... if if you got a good, decent vehicle, you know, I mean, the power, the, the, the power assistance, it, it was revolutionary 
uh, even in the natural. As humans, we become power assisted when we are endued or clothed with power from on high. God knows that we are powerless apart from his spirit. He knows that we are powerless. We have great potential, but potential doesn't equal power. We have potential, but we are powerless until we are clothed with power from on high. Yes, there is a power at work in us, transforming us, fashioning us, shaping us into the image of Christ. But His power upon us equips us to do the works of Christ. Having the nature of Christ and never do the works of Christ, that, that is a contradiction. To have His Spirit in us and His Spirit not upon us, there's a gap. Something is missing. It's not the whole work of God in our life. God knows that we are powerless apart from His Spirit upon our life. That's why so many burn out and quit. You want to know why Christians burn out? You know why they quit? It's not because God stops being good. It's not because God cuts off His promises or His grace or His power. It's because they find this place in life where they are trying to do the work of God without the power of God. Anybody ever ran that engine without oil in it and it locks up? That's what you're seeing in people's lives these days. They're trying to do the work of God. They're sincere. They have a passion. They have a desire. God, I want to do something great for you. And, and, and that's wonderful. But to do the work of God apart from the power of God, you're going to burn up. You're going to quit. You're going to grow weary. You're going to find ways to draw back and depart from the, even the faith. Or you'll keep running, but you'll grow calloused and wore out and bitter. You won't even have a passion to do the work of God without the power of God. God created us powerless so that he could baptize us with power. The promise that birthed the church in the beginning will be the promise that carries the church till the end. I believe that the days that we are headed in, I just want to encourage you, the word that God spoke a couple of Sundays ago, it's still the word of the Lord, okay? What Bill is teaching about finances, I want to encourage you, if your finances are in disarray, get in that class. It works. It works. Okay, it's biblical wisdom. It will work, okay? The days that are coming, you need to get your house in order. You need to get things in order, your finances, everything, your health, Everything. Get it in order. I believe there's a season that God is giving his church to make preparation. Okay? Get things in order. Okay? Don't get anxious. Don't get scared. Don't get worried. Okay? God, you, you set out to do it. You, you, you submit to the will and the purposes of God, and God will give you grace and space to get it done. Okay? Don't worry about, do I have enough time? Stop worrying about that. Okay? God created time. He can grow it, man. He can extend it. All right? He, he, and I don't ask me how he does it, okay? My brain ain't big enough to explain the ways of God. I just know he can do it, okay? Anybody ever seen God stretch a dollar and make it a hundred? I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he just does it, okay? And so get in that class. Get your finances in order. Get your life in order. But in addition to getting things in order, get empowered. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to walk victoriously in the days to come. The destiny on your life is that you would be not just an overcomer, but Scripture says more than a conqueror. Okay? The promise that birthed the church in the beginning will be the church and the pro excuse me, the promise that will carry the church in the end. What is that promise? The promise is simply this. Come on, declare this with me. This needs to be on the wall somewhere, all right? But you shall... Receive power when the Holy Spirit has come where? Upon you, and you shall be witnesses. What? To me, or for me, in Jerusalem, that's my immediate surroundings, Judea, that means extended surroundings, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's talking about influence. All right? The Spirit upon my life, 
The power of God operating upon my life in me and through me will cause me to be a true witness, a true testimony, a true beacon, a true light, a city set on a hill. And I will be this witness for God everywhere I go. That promise is for you. Lay hold of that promise until it becomes your reality. Lay hold of the altar and altar and don't let go. Be like Jacob and say, listen, I don't care if we've got to wrestle all night. I'm not letting go until you change who I am. I don't want to. The sun better not come up unless I'm changed. I love that tenacity. God loves that tenacity. That, that, that you, God's not afraid of that. God's not afraid of that hunger. You meet God with that type of intense passion and hunger and God will say, oh boy, I'm going to. Yes, I'm going to honor that. I'm going to honor that. That promise is made to you, and God keeps his promises, every single one of them. The part two of that promise is this, Acts 2, 17, and that is this, that in the last days, God says, I will, say that with me, I will, I will pour out my spirit. There's that word again, upon, not within, but I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's the supernatural works of God right there. That's one of the reasons we receive the baptism of the spirit. Because it allows us to step in to the supernatural works of God. You cannot prophesy without the baptism of the spirit. You can repeat the word and there's nothing wrong with that. You can repeat the logos, you can repeat what God has said, but you can't necessarily speak or declare what God is saying. And we'll explain that in this series. We're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit and, and, and how the baptism of the Spirit steps us in, or it is an entrance, a doorway, into the operation of the supernatural works, the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my Spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. There's a lot of false prophets right now called news networks. Okay, they're false messengers. They're deceitful in every way, wicked and evil, demonic. Okay, I don't care if that offends you. I don't care if you, I hope that your loyalty is not to man. But Jesus even told us what the last days would look like. Many would be offended. <laughs> well, who's the instigators? These false messengers, okay, these dividers, these ones who sow discord, even among brethren, okay? Well, in the midst of that, God's going to raise up true messengers, people that speak the word of the Lord, okay? The word of the Lord. I don't care what the news is telling me. I want to know what God is speaking. What is God telling me? Because he sees the end from the beginning. He knows it all. And he is a searcher. He searches the hearts of men. And he can tell me where we're going. He can tell me what I need to do before we get there. Amen? Do you believe that? Are you in covenant with him? My life is his. Apart from him, I have nothing. And apart from him, I can do nothing. God, my life is yours. I've got nowhere else to go. I don't even want to go anywhere else, God. But I'm just letting you know, all my cards are on you. Oh, everything's on you. And you've got to take care of me. And you've got to lead me. And you've got to provide for me. And you've got to do everything for me that I cannot do for myself. Amen. And you know what? God's like, I got this. <laughs> I got this. He doesn't hear that and go, oh, my goodness. My goodness, son, you're always aggravating me. No, no, he's like, that's my pleasure. That's my joy, son, to reveal myself in you and through you. Now, by the way, I do care if I offend you. I never would want to offend you. But if it's the word of the Lord, you've got to take it up with him. Okay, leave me out of it. Okay, I cannot apologize for him. I'm not going to. Okay? But, no, I don't purposefully offend anybody. You know, it's quite possible, and pastors end up doing it all the time, offending people that I never knew I offended. That's taxing. 
This is happening. This promise is happening right now. This will continue to happen and even increase in measure and regularity as we approach Jesus' return. Do you understand that the, the world that we have, okay, okay, I, I don't care what the world is planning to do. <laughs> it's all going to vanquish. Do you know it's all going to come to naught? It's all going to come to nothing. I don't care. Why? Because there is an eternal purpose that is at hand right now. And it is this, the Lord is getting his bride ready for a marriage. Okay, we are getting ready for eternity. And there is going to be a moment that Jesus returns. All right, and as we see that day approaching, the intensity of the work of the Spirit and the outpouring of the Spirit. Right now, I believe it's just a trickle. But there's going to be a cloud that it's just going to increase. And this outpouring is just going to increase. And it's going to be amazing. And it is happening right now. Central to this mighty outpouring of God's Spirit is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We learned last week that there is a difference between the Holy Spirit within me and the Holy Spirit upon me. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the moment in the believer's life when he or she is endued or clothed, just like this jacket is upon me. I'm clothed in this jacket when I am clothed with power from on high. To fully understand the baptism in the Holy Spirit, one must understand that there is a distinct difference between being born of the Spirit and being baptized in the Spirit. There is a distinct difference, all right? Throughout the four Gospels, Jesus made a clear distinction between the two works of the Spirit. All right, you got to read the Gospels and you'll see Jesus making a distinction between the two works of the Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate work from salvation, yet a subsequent work of salvation or from salvation. In other words, it's separate from salvation, but it is to happen in sequence with. It comes after salvation, all right? It's the same Holy Spirit at work, but doing the work at a separate moment, but in sync with one another. God wants you to be both transformed or saved and endued or baptized with the Holy Spirit. He wants you raised from dead or raised from your sin. You were once in, dead in your trespasses. He wants you raised from dead and then he wants you filled with life. He wants you filled with the power of his spirit. That's his desire. That's his promise. That's why Jesus called it the promise of the Father. That's why Jesus said, it's not good that I remain. I need to go away. Okay? Because when I go away, I'm sending one after me. And the one after me is not going to just be with you. He's going to be in you. And he's going to be upon you. And he's going to empower you to do what John 14 says. You do, will do the works that I do and greater works than these. That is the church. You can live a life without the power of the Holy Spirit. You just can't have a victorious life. And you can wrestle with that. You know, sometimes it's just wise to lay down our defenses. Sometimes it's, it's just good just to take off the boxing gloves and say, okay, I'm not going to fight today. I'm not going to fight. I, I'm, I'm just going to... I'm just going to consider, is this the word of the Lord? Point in case, look at the life of the disciples prior to the baptism of the Spirit. They didn't say they didn't live a good life. They saw some great things. They said some great things. They got to be a part of some great things. But after the baptism of the Spirit, they birthed some great things. They initiated some great things. They knew what to do in dark times. Old Peter, who wanted to pull out the sword anytime something didn't sit well with him, he now had hands that wouldn't draw a sword, but he had hands that would heal. He had words that would actually convict hearts instead of offend people. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
You can live a life without the power of the Holy Spirit. You just can't live a victorious life. Any success and experience in this life, any ministry accomplishment, any sense of victory that you experience apart from the power of God or the dunamis. Do you know what dunamis means? Do, not just power, not just any power, but power for the supernatural works. Okay? You can do a word study. We're not going to do it today. You can do it on your own. All right? That's your lesson for this week. Study what dunamis means. Study dunamis power. Dunamis power. So, so, so uh, uh, any, anything that we do apart from the dunamis power of God is temporal. It's masked or it's within our own strength. This is what the Lord says. It is not by my force or not by my strength, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven. There's a lot of things you can do for God apart from God. And he'll let you. Right? You can birth a bunch of uh, uh, Ishmaels. God will let you go have Ishmaels everywhere. But God wants you to have an Isaac. God has the promise of an Isaac in your life. Amen? Why should you and I seek to be clothed with the power of God? Well, first of all, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of boldness and courage. You ever heard anybody say, man, he's on fire. Man, she's on fire. It's a baptism of boldness. It is a baptism of courage. It burns up timidity. It is a baptism that brings clarity and authority to speech. Paul said, I didn't come to you with the words and the wisdom of man. I didn't come to you with eloquent speech. Paul said, listen, Paul was a brain. Paul was, was an, a super intelligent man. He, he could philosophize, is that a word? <laughs> philosophize with any philosopher. He said, but I didn't bring you all that. That's not what, I, even though I could have brought you that and I could have awed you, I could have, I could have, my, my, my charisma and, and my eloquent speech, it, it could have had an impact on you, but I didn't bring that. I didn't bring that to you. I came preaching the gospel, confirming the words that I spoke with signs, wonders, and miracles. What equipped Paul to do that? It was the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit releases you to walk in the supernatural. Receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit becomes the entrance or the doorway into the gifts of the Spirit. Now, if you're looking to the American church as a point of reference to validate these statements, let me ask you, please don't. Because we've built big churches that have form but no power. We have. But God's shaking it. He's shaking it. And everything that is not abiding in Him, it's falling off. It's falling off. Look at you. You're still here. Praise God. Can you just stop and say, thank you, Jesus. It's not, it's not anything that I've done. It's something I've allowed. Praise God. Rejoice in that. I don't want to depart from the faith. God, have mercy on us. Spare me from deceit. God, spare us from self-deceit. God, I don't want to lie to myself. Mm. If you have to spend time convincing someone that what you're doing is of God, you've deceived yourself. If you have to explain, now wait a minute, this is God. I know it don't look like God, but it's God. You've, you've deceived yourself. Be cautious of those who exert their energy and trying to convince and explain. 
You don't have to explain the work of God. The work of God doesn't even need words to go with it. The work of God itself is the testimony that indeed, this is God. Who healed you of your blindness. I don't know. I don't know his name. I don't have the words to describe what just happened to me. All I know is this. Once I was blind and now I see. That's God. That's God. I don't even know where I'm at. Sorry. Look at the life of the disciples after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the face of persecution. After Jesus was crucified, they thought they were next. And where do we find them? In John chapter 20 somewhere. They're hiding out. But after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know where they're at? They're in public. They're in the synagogue. They're preaching. Even under the eye and under the, under the threat of of being jailed and and persecuted. They say, listen, whether it be right in your eyes or not, we, you know, God will be the judge, but listen, we can't keep silent. It's like fire shut up in our bones. We've been set on fire. The baptism of the Spirit has come upon us, and listen, if you got to throw us in jail, okay, we'll start singing worship songs and be out by sunlight. Those days are coming, church. Call me a lunatic, a fool if you want, but they're coming. Listen, if I get jailed, please, don't assume that I've done something wrong. Go ahead and assume that I've done something right. Okay? Let's start believing the best in people. Okay? Let, 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 let's be absent of gossip and slander and busybodiness. Oh, my goodness, he's in jail. Wait a minute. Jay, are you going to meet me in there? Yes, sir. All right. Some of y'all have to show me around. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's going to be some good days. Uncertain days. Never been through those days before. God's going to take care of us. He is. That's going to be part of the testimony. That's going to be part of the, uh, of the distinction. You know, go all the way back to the Old Testament. Every Gentile nation would look over at Israel. Who's those crazy people roaming around in the desert? Their shoes never run out. They always got water. They've always got food. You know... And Scripture says that, that even in their craziness, God was taking care of them. And what he was doing is he was making them the envy of the Gentile world. That's what's going to happen in the days to come. Part of being a witness is going to be living under the covenant and experiencing as your reality the promises of God. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be excited. Listen, you've got to let go of, 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 of this passion or this pursuit for familiar. You can't follow the cloud and expect everything to be familiar. You can't be led of the Spirit because He's going to lead you in places and moments you've never been. But what brings a sense of peace is not that you've been there before, but that you know who's leading you there. That's what gives you peace. You keep your eyes on the shepherd... And it doesn't matter where he leads you. He's going to always prepare for you a table. And he's going to always lead you into green pastures. I'm trying to build your faith. Because listen, what's coming is coming whether you want it to or not. It's coming. So I want to encourage you, go ahead and get in Christ. Go ahead and get in the church. Go ahead and get under the flow. Get under the covenant. And go ahead and get ready and get equipped with the power of God. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. He turns and he says, I want you to go and tarry. Say that with me. Tarry, not T-E-R-R-Y. We got a tarry. But this is tarry. 
This is T-A-R-R-Y. Go and tarry. Go and wait. In other words, you go there and don't you leave there. Go there and you wait until what? Until you are endued or clothed with power. And where is it coming from, church? It's coming from high. It's coming from on high. I want to ask you something. Can you point to that moment? Can you point to a moment when you know you waited, when you tarried? Have you tarried? Can you point to a moment when you tarried or you waited until you received power? From on high, you knew that you were now clothed in power. Scripture says that they had been there 10 days and then suddenly, suddenly there came a sound. And praise God, they didn't run. They said, we've never heard this sound before, but we know this is God. And the Bible says that there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And with that sound from heaven or that rushing wind came what? Cloven tongues of fire that rested upon each of them. Praise God. It didn't just rest upon half of them. God baptized everyone there with the Holy Spirit. And they were clothed in Power. The two greatest lies of Satan to the believer are this. Number one, the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't for today. That is a lie. That is a lie. Number two, number two lie of the enemy is this. You can be a Christian and perfectly fine without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me closely. Listen to me closely, church. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not essential for salvation. That is a separate work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? We are not saying, nor will we ever say, nor do we teach, we will never teach that the baptism of the Holy the baptism of the Holy Spirit is essential for salvation. Don't ever confuse those words. But it is essential for being an effective witness. That doesn't mean that God won't use you, but there is an effectiveness, and then there is a moment where you actually become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Why do you think Satan has worked so hard to create such division in the church over this baptism? Why such criticism? Why such confusion? Why such cynicism and even distance or disdain for this baptism? Why do you think he's worked so hard to expose and point out those who seemingly walk in the power of the Holy Spirit but do not possess the fruit of the Spirit? By the way, don't walk in the power of the Spirit and not produce the fruit of the Spirit. Who cares if you can lay hands on the sick if you can't love the lost? This is why, because he wants people to love God, yet live void of God's power. He's okay if you love God and live a, a devotion to God, but dare do not let God use you as his instrument, as his vessel. It is the power of God resting upon man, operating through man, that is the greatest threat to Satan's kingdom. God is not afraid of you living morally right and going to church and paying your bills and being debt free. He doesn't care about that. You're not a threat to his kingdom. You're just one that he lost. He doesn't want you to be a weapon in the hands of God. He doesn't want you to ever be a threat to what he is doing because he is active and he is at work in this land and he is deceiving and devouring and killing people left and right. But it is the power of God resting upon man, operating through man, that is the greatest threat to Satan's kingdom. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not optional for the believer's life. It is not an option, church. And we've got to stop living as though it is. We've got to stop being okay that I don't yet have this baptism. It doesn't mean that you are less valuable. It doesn't mean that you are less loved. This is not talking about your, your worth. It's talking about your effectiveness. And that's two different things. It doesn't mean that, that you are looked down upon. It doesn't mean that you're in the back in the kingdom. No, 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 no. Get, get, get your thinking out of that thinking. 
Let me show you something. We'll close here in just a minute. Let me prove what I'm saying to you this morning. In the eighth chapter of Acts, we find Philip. Does anybody know who Philip is? Philip was an evangelist. If we talk about the fivefold giftings, Philip was gifted, anointed to be an evangelist. Okay? He's also one of the first ordained deacons. One of the first deacons ordained in the church, but also an evangelist. His heart burned for the lost, and he lived to be a bridge from the world into the church. In Acts chapter 8, we find him in a city called Samaria. Now that in and of itself is amazing. Do you understand? I just said Samaria. Anybody know? Jews weren't supposed to go hang out in Samaria. By the way, that's a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You start loving people that don't look like you. And you no longer are timid. You, you, you know, don't go across those tracks to Samaria. No, the, the power of God rests upon my life. I don't fear what man can do to me. And so he is in Samaria. And he is preaching the gospel. And he is preaching the gospel to the lost. And if you've ever read Acts chapter 8, what happens? Great revival breaks out. Miracles begin to accompany the preaching of God's word. People turn from pagan worship to Jesus Christ. That's when they start bringing all their bad movies and magazines and everything and burning them. Right? That's in the Bible. All right? They turn from sin to salvation, from darkness to light. New converts are baptized, making them fully-fledged members. I mean, it's a mass baptism, okay? That means, and they're baptized into Jesus Christ. That means they are full-fledged members of the body of Christ, okay? They are Christians, okay? You understand that? There's no, there's no question about it. As a matter of fact, let me just read here. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Wouldn't it be awesome if every time we preach the gospel, God affirmed the gospel preaching by signs, wonders, and miracles? What if we made room? What if we made room every service? We knew that at the end of the preaching of the word, every time we gathered, that sick people would be healed, lost people would be saved, drug addicts would be set free, and people seeking the baptism of the Spirit would be baptized. What if we had a baptism over here that just stayed warmed all the time and just people got baptized every Sunday? Would you like that atmosphere? Do you believe that that atmosphere can be our reality? Well, listen, before it can come, we listen, you, you got to give something God to bless. You got to give him something to bless. You got to give him something to answer. And God doesn't answer hope. God answers prayers. God answers prayers. I promise you, well, I'll tell you at the end, God gave me a word for us. The Bible says, for un the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, verse 7, for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. I love that verse. There was great joy in the city. This is the moment when, when Simon the sorcerer, how many remember him? This is the moment that he was saved. He was saved in this revival, all right? It was a powerful moment in the life of the church. Yet, despite this powerful move of God, when the word travels from Samaria all the way back to Jerusalem, the base, that's, that's where the headquarters of the church is. That's where Peter and John are, the, 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 the first apostles. When they get word back in Jerusalem, as to what has happened in Samaria. I want you to understand that actually what we see in Acts chapter 8 is we see them responding not in terms of what is happening in Samaria. We actually see them responding in terms of what is not happening in Samaria. Are you following me? In other words, they're excited about what is happening, but immediately the question is, well, wait a minute, there's something not happening. Something is happening, but we are now focused on what is not happening in Samaria. That's some wisdom, if you ask me. I think it's wise sometimes to, to rejoice in what is happening, 
but also ask God, God, is there anything left? Is there anything more? Because that's what the apostles immediately begin to do. And the thinking of the apostles, who, by the way, I think are a little bit more wise than me and you, I think, all right? They think that there is something vital missing in the miracle working revival of Samaria. Listen, if people start getting set free from demons and people start getting baptized and there is great joy in the city, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, I would have probably said it can't get better than this. I probably would have packed up, headed to El Bracero and said, listen, awesome day. Awesome day. It can't, let's do this again. It can't get any better than this. But the apostles said, uh-uh. Uh-uh. There's, there's the rest of the story. Wait a minute. It's, it's not done yet. It's not done. We are not dismissing what God has done, but God ain't done. What happens? In Acts chapter 8, Peter and John actually load up and head on down to Samaria for one reason and one reason only. And it is this, to lay hands on all the new converts so that they might receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me read it for you. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon. Say that word with me. Upon. There it is again. The Spirit was within. Right? Because it drove out demons. The Holy Spirit's not going to possess a temple and share it with demons. Demons left. Holy Spirit comes in. Holy Spirit is within. But the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. For they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? They had only been converted. But they hadn't been empowered. Verse 17, Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if that took an hour or two hours. I am a little offended with the New Testament writers because they don't put timetables in this stuff. I don't know if it happened instantly or if they had to do like we used to have to do, Terry. Wait. Wait until. Wait until you be endued. Now what we see are two things. First, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate moment from conversion. We see the baptism of the Spirit separate from being born in the Spirit. Does, does everybody see that? Yes. The second thing we see is this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is essential. Amen. Peter and John said, listen, Philip, we're glad for what had happened. has happened. We're excited. Thank you, brother. We're proud of you. But we're going to come on down there. Come on, because God ain't done yet. God started something, and we're going to come down and make sure that we get the church positioned correctly. And we're going to come down there and we're going to lay hands on everybody because the destiny on their life and the purpose of God on their life requires the power of God upon their life. We're going to pray that they receive the baptism of the Spirit, and they do. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is essential. It is a non-negotiable. It is the promise of the Father. And all of God's children should seek to receive this wonderful gift of God. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is an empowering experience that is essential for introducing the Christian into the supernatural realm of the Christian life. Let me read that for you again. We're establishing clear doctrine here, okay? Clear understanding. One of the most, not, not, if, if it's not disputed, it's one of the most inter, misunderstood doctrines in the body of Christ. Amen. And that is this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an empowering experience that is essential 
for introducing the Christian into the supernatural realm of the Christian life. God does not want you living in just the natural realm with a little bit of Jesus. He wants you completely transforming the natural realm with the supernatural work and power of God. God doesn't want to do something. Listen, we are his hands and feet. And there are some times where God wants us to heal. But there's a lot of times coming, especially where God wants us to, excuse me, hug, but he wants us to heal. The church has been good at, at loving the lost. But by golly, we've struggled to deliver the lost and set them free. I believe that that empowering is coming. It's coming. I want to close with this. Mike, you can come. Team, you can come. We're going to close in a moment, and then we're going to get a bunch of snow. It feels like Christmas Eve, doesn't it? With no, with no gifts. I know some of y'all are praying against the snow, but you're just wasting your time, okay? <laughs> Kelly has been fasting for seven days that we would get snow, and my goodness. Tasha, too? Who else has been praying for this? I just want one good snow, okay? And then we can go on into spring. I'm sorry, Steve. We're getting snow, okay? It's coming. In Jesus' name, can I get a witness? Hallelujah. I just want a reason not to leave the house, okay? I want to be able to say, no, I'm snowed in. I ain't, I'm not doing anything today, all right? My phone ain't working. I'm just kidding. I, I think it'll work. But I, wanna, I, wanna, I, want, I want you to see something here. I was praying this week. I was praying for the, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 that came last Sunday seeking the baptism of the Spirit. I went home last week. I, I wasn't disappointed or anything because we got to learn to tarry. We got to learn to tarry. We want microwave, we, right? We want to push a few buttons and boom, here it is. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I got to get that American, that, 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 I got to get that out of you. So I was praying for these people, these individuals, and, and God began to speak to me some things. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is God's promise. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is God's promise to every single believer. It's God's promise that's here. It has to become our pursuit. It has to become our pursuit. And this is not just, this, this word is not just for those who have yet to receive this baptism. This word is for those of you that received the baptism years ago and you're not walking in the power. It's time to step up. And that word, that's the convicting word over my life too. Brad, I didn't give you this power to make you com comfortable. He even told me, he said, Brad, do you like controversy? I was like, no. Who does? I mean, we don't go looking for controversy. He said, but Brad, would you give up comfort for controversy? if you could see the full work of my power. It's like, well, Lord, I've got to be honest with you. My flesh don't like it, but boy, my spirit wants it. God's promise, our pursuit. I'm saying this, church, that right now, these are not on the same street. We've got to marry them. We've got to bring them up to the same place where our pursuit must match God's promise. What I mean by that is if it's God's promise, it has to become our pursuit. Think of all the things that capture your time. Think of all the things that capture your pursuit. Think of all the things that capture and control our pursuit that brings us no lasting joy. I want to close with this. There's a passage of Scripture. I don't know if you knew this was in the Word of God. I've heard this passage of Scripture spoken, and, and, and guys, you know, needing a new jet, they'll say this. They'll, they'll preach this gospel, or people needing a new house. And, and, and I'm not going to get into that, okay? But I want you to know that this whole 
keep asking, keep knocking, keep asking, uh, and, and, and you will receive. That is actually a promise connected to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says this, and so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive. Come on. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who... Oh, that word everyone. Say it with me. For everyone who asks. See, you can want something and never ask for it. I got kids. They do this to me all the time. One night I heard Judah crying. Judah, that's what you get for being in big church, son. I'm going to point you out. I I heard it like a whimpering. I was like, wait a minute. He should be asleep. Why is he whimpering? I go up and I'm, Judah, what is wrong? I mean, this is a couple years ago. He don't do this anymore. He rules the house now. But he, he's got tears in his eyes and he's whimpering. I mean, he'd been up for a while. He'd been laying in that bed forever, okay? A couple hours maybe. I was like, son, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm hungry. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got cabinets full of food down here. Why in the world are you laying here in this bed hungry when all you got to do is get up and ask? Why would you lay here and go without when your dad and your mom are are more than willing to to give if you'll just ask? And that's where some of us are. We're wanting, but we're not asking. He says, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks will find. You can desire something and never seek it. You can desire something and never, ever, ever take the initiative to go after it. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Watch this. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? We've got some great dads in this house. I'm proud of you dads. Some of you are awesome. All of you are awesome dads. Would you, if your son or daughter asked for a a, a fish, would you give them a snake? No. Or if they ask for an egg, which, that's weird. Do you give them a scorpion? If they ask for a donut, (laughs) come on, let's bring this up to date. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, watch this. How much more will your heavenly Father give them the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask. To those who what? Ask. To those who do what? Ask. Not hope, not want, not desire, not pray real hard, but ask. Ask Him. Our seeking, our asking will always precede God's giving and our receiving. Listen, God's going to pour out His Spirit on this church. Everyone that asks will receive. Everyone that asks will receive. But our seeking and our asking will always precede God's giving. God needs to find you in that place of seeking and asking continuously until you receive that promise. God wants to give it to you, but you've got to learn to ask. What does seeking look like? I I don't want to be funny, but I've always been mesmerized by Black Friday. I have. I don't like, I don't participate in Black Friday, okay? I think those people are silly. But the reality is, people make great sacrifices. They even, they are even willing to to, to go with less of what is important, family time, sleep, get out in those crazy temperatures, crazy crowds. Why? Because they have the chance to get something very costly for less. 
that is what you call seeking. They make sacrifices. What does seeking look like in your life? If you was to say, Pastor Red, I'm seeking. I'm asking. What does it look like? What does it look like? What is the evidence of your seeking and your asking? Anybody ever lost a child? Anybody ever lost a child in a department store? You become undignified real quick. I don't care who does not like how I'm acting right now. My child is lost. And I'm not going to be casual until I find him or her. I will rip this store up and down, left and right. I'll go, I'll scream. Where are you? I don't care what anybody thinks about me right now. I have lost something precious to me. And I want it back. Praise God, you've never lost this. It's just waiting on you. What is God calling you to do? What does seeking look like? What does asking look like in your life? You ever, you ever search for a job? You ever been without a job? And you're searching intently? You don't, you don't care how long it takes. You don't care what resources. You don't care who you got to call. Hey, you guys got any work for me? I'm ready to go. If they said to you, you'd be here tonight at midnight and your favorite show or whatever, I don't know, something important was happening, you know what you'd say? I'll be there. I'll be there at midnight. You mean you want me to go without sleep tonight? I don't care. I need a job. I need a job. My family needs to eat. I need a job. Desperate. You, you, you start making sacrifices, right? You, you, you do whatever you got to do get what's coming to you. The church seeking, asking, and knocking has a look, it has a sound, it has action. I don't know what it looks like in your life, but I will say this, we will know when our pursuit, there will be an evidence of our pursuit. We will know indeed this church as a whole is seeking that wonderful promise when it happens. Amen? Amen. I want us to do something this morning. We're going to close in just a second. Uh, we're going to end in worship. And uh, <clears throat> I want us to just, I just want us to spend a few minutes seeking this wonderful promise. If you've yet to receive, begin asking. Begin asking. Begin seeking the Lord. I'm going to pray over us. I'm going to pray over us because I think sometimes the enemy can hold, can hold our asking, our seeking, and our knocking. I think he can hold it hostage. I think he can cloak our seeking with fear, with shame. We're actually going to talk in this series, what are the hindrances to being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Some of us, a simple hindrance is you won't open your mouth. Your mouth. This thing right here. Uh, this mouth. If you're wanting the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you bring God silence, I'm not saying that there's not a moment for silence, but He just said you got to ask. You can't ask in your heart. Uh, yes, you can. But asking, you, you do that with your mouth. So let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you to lift your hands. Just, just, just allow me for a few seconds to just, let's wait on the Lord.